Welcome to That Life Reimagined. Today I have Ryan Leach. Ryan is someone to watch in the veterinary industry because he is one of the most informed individuals on all things that impact our profession. Ryan brings a unique sales background that astounds me and is one of the most likable people you'll meet. We'll talk about how the veterinary industry won him over. We'll talk about what you need to know when it comes to things happening in veterinary consolidation. And I asked Ryan to predict what he thinks is in store for our future. And I think you'll be interested in his response. He puts all his knowledge and insights in a weekly podcast called The Bird Bath, which are 10 to 15 minute episodes on the important industry updates. All this on this episode of Vet Life Reimagined. So let's get to that conversation with Ryan Leach. Recorded at VMX 2024. Well, thank you for joining me early in the morning on the yeah. last day of VMX. And I'm really excited to learn more about your story because we have, we met at the Veterinary Innovation Summit right. and headed off well, mm -hmm. both podcasters, yep. and we have a big passion around that. And the more I meet you, the more I learn about you, the more interesting you get. Oh, thank and you. Understanding <laughs> how many people you know in the veterinary industry is just really neat. So you definitely did not start in the veterinary industry. I did not. So when did you get into this crazy profession? Yeah, it was not something that I had viewed or, or planned, really. I was told that I was allergic to dogs when I was a little kid. And that's why I wasn't allowed to have a dog. Mm. I don't know if that... I have dogs now and I'm not sneezing. So someone <laughs> was allergic to, to dogs, but yeah, I never really had any, um, animals. I had fish growing up that I guess I'm kind of entrepreneurial, but I, they would have their little, they'd lay their eggs, have their babies. And then I would take the babies and grow them into another aquarium in my room and then sell those to the company that cleaned the fish tank for us to pay for the fish tank cleaning. But that's my only, that was my only animal experience. <laughs> and so, yeah, I came right out of college. I always enjoyed sales and business and started selling cars. So I liked cars. They were fast. <laughs> they make, they're shiny. They make big noises. Um, and yeah, and so I worked in the auto industry for about five years, but I kept seeing the emergence of business that was going to be direct to consumer and, and it hasn't happened yet, but I still do believe that we'll see the elimination or the reduction of the auto dealership model, the finance model, like a lot of those things are shaking up and they have over the past since I left the, the space and I wanted to get into startups. I've always liked the idea of startups. For me, I, I really get passionate when it's like, I put in X amount of effort and I see that direct impact on an entire organization as opposed to, I, you know, Hey, if I, you know, hammer away as hard as I can, it raised the end goal of the company from a hundred billion to a hundred billion and one dollars. And you're like, <laughs> Oh, that's didn't really make an impact. I like to be like 50% of this we can attribute to like what Ryan helped us build. So that's why I went into the startup space. I worked for a company that was acquired by booking.com and learned a lot about technology and remote sales. So we were selling all over the country. We were doing zoom calls back in 2014, I think way before it was fashionable, yes. way before it was fashionable, <laughs> Google meets. And like, I was like, what are you, you're sharing your screen and like people show up and we like show up, this is crazy. But I kept finding that there were like things that were the status quo, like the expectation. And one of the things that we had there was people would sell 12 websites. We were selling websites to hoteliers and people would say, Oh, I sold 12. That was like an incredible month. Wow. We killed it. And I was looking, I was like, what is the decision-making set? What are they actually thinking about what's happening here? And I realized that what we were actually selling was more people booking rooms, right? That was the end goal. More people show up and decide to make a reservation and stay with you. And when you get the opportunity for them to make their reservation, you can have them as you, if you book, you know, hotels online, right? That you add a bottle of champagne when you arrive or mm -hmm. you add a spa credit or like, adding that cart component to it. And I was like, that's what we're doing. Like the website is great, but that's the vehicle to drive it. If we can just talk with them about 
the direct analytics and the impact of with this system, you can go from paying a travel agency or a booking.com or a company like that, you know, 10%, eight to 12, 10%, right? To 5% direct with us, you'll make more money and you'll get more people in. And so I re-envisioned the whole thing that we were doing and said, you know, we can sell a hundred of these per person per month. And just, so I found two other crazy guys in the company with me and we completely scrapped the entire playbook of everything that was going on. We got extra phone lines so that we could dial one phone while talking on the other because you had to find like this minute details. I cut down from saying, hi, this is Ryan with booking.com. I'm calling to, Hey, Ryan with booking.com or Hey, Ryan with booking. And like knowing that cutting down those 15 seconds of warmness to begin with allowed me to call an extra eight people a day. I could close 20%, you know, each week I could pick up an extra seven to 12 deal. And so building that. And so I always enjoyed finding those nuances, but there's always new technology. And so I was continually looking for new things. I, I joined Red Hat, which is a Linux software company in their emerging technology space. Cause someone told me about Docker, which is like Kubernetes. It's uh, the idea that there's a physical component and a capacity to technology, but through software and utilization of them, you can actually increase the capacity of the physical hardware through the technology. It's, and it made my brain spin, so I wanted to explore it and learn more about it. And then I kept wanting to, you know, make a bigger impact. They were the largest, one of the largest software companies in the world. They were acquired by IBM. And I heard about a mobile gas delivery company, which was one of my wife's friends posted on Facebook and said, oh my gosh, what a stupid idea. <laughs> and it's a company that you have an app on your phone, you park click a button on your phone and someone comes and fills your car up with gas. And I was like, yeah, yeah, perfect. That's, that's a perfect idea. But the CEO and the founder, he was self-described as extremely overeducated. He was a, he went to Princeton, Harvard, and Stanford. He was a former rocket scientist. So being on public facing conversations and sales meetings was not his strong suit. And so I just reached out and I said, hey, you need someone that can do this. And he said, no, I don't. I said, yes, you do. He said, no, I don't. I said, I'm going to quit my job tomorrow and come and work for you. He said, I'm not hiring you. I said, that's okay. I'll sh I'm just going to come. And I did. Showed up. Worked for a day. I said, should I come back tomorrow? I said, yeah, come back tomorrow. Okay. And I did that for like a week. And then I was like, can we say I'll come back for a whole week? Yeah. Can I come back for a whole month? And I was there for, for a couple of years. I ended up building and leading their sales team. I ended up, I was an interim GM running Texas for them. They were over $200 million of fundraising round. There. They got a lot of money. <laughs> they, got, they raised a lot of money for things. And it was really interesting to see that experience. So I learned about the venture capitalist field, but I, the passion that kept coming to me and I, you know, hopefully I'm getting there, right? Right. <laughs> is was that I continued to find that I really enjoy working with CEOs and founders that are spending too much time worrying about their sales teams and the numbers of what the people on the floor are doing and, oh, where's this lead? And, and they can't at that point take the chance to run the business. If they're spending too much time worrying about the nuances, they can't focus on the business. So I, I, I started my own sales consulting business, which was gets to the answer of your question, but I started my own sales consulting business called First 100. And the goal was I wanted to work with companies that had under 100 employees or under 100 clients. So I wanted them to be smaller and small enough that the CEO and the founder was usually still just sitting there doing sales calls on demos, on Everything. doing yeah, yeah, and be able to say, I can build this for you. I can get the team in a good spot. I can train your team and I can get you a sales director, salesman, whatever you want, train them. And you can be in a completely different world, worried about the overall growth of the company, but have dashboards and technology to be able to say, how many people called us? How many leads came in? What were the sales like? Where are we? Are we? And, but not have to sit down and go, come on, please, Megan, what, what's going on? What's going on? So that was, I, I, that was what I built and did it for a whole different world of, I 
worked with private jet companies, private airlines, craft cocktail companies, event companies. And one night over dinner, my father-in-law, who's a veterinarian and was working with uh, practice management software, kept telling me, you know, we need to sell more. I don't know why they're not closing deals. It's taking away focus from the CEO and the founder. And I, I was like, Say more. <laughs> you know what I do, right? Yeah. You know, like, you know how I, I, I put food on the table. He was like, oh, yeah, but, you know, we don't, I have a very serious, I don't like to do mixed business and family. And he was like, I know. But I was like, yeah, okay. Just give my email to the CEO. Neither one of us is rec recommending the other one. And that was Hippo Practice Management Software. So that was my first foray into the vet space by working with Sam and the team Hippo. First as a consultant, and then ultimately I, I came on full time leading sales and marketing for him. And the thing that was really interesting was when I came in, I looked at the demographics of the business, right? It's primarily a, and still to this day, even with all the consolidation, they're independently owned businesses. The owner is the operator, is the DVM, is the worrying about every nuance of the business. A lot of times it's generational businesses. A lot of times family works within the business with them. They usually own the real estate. And in my naivety, I looked at it and said, well, what they're trying to do is get more people to make more bookings or reservations or appointments and come in and then being able to streamline that process. I said, I did that. <laughs> I did that for booking.com. Easy. No problem. Here's the playbook that I have for how to sell to hotels. It was super easy. It will, will be quadruple sales in, in a month. No, <laughs> no. I was very quickly slapped around and chewed up and spit out by the veterinary community, which I liked mm. because it was a challenge. I learned from it and I, I sat down with, you know, with the team and I was like, okay, what are we missing? What are the conversations? And what we ended up doing was pretty much going through the entire sales team and changing a lot of the people's roles and hiring new people that were former vet techs that understood the nuances of when someone's answering the phone in the clinic. The story they always said was like, if you call at two o'clock and they say that the doctor can't talk because they're in surgery, they're lying to you, right? They did surgery that morning. They're not do like the understanding of the nuance of what's happening in the clinic versus what the front desk is saying. Like, no, you can't talk to the owner right now. They're, um, they're doing drop off points. You're like, wait, but they, wouldn't have they had, like, so I had none of that. I knew none of that. And so I really relied on the, the teams, the technicians that came in and I thought it was a cool opportunity to be able to allow technicians that had seen perhaps some burnout or physical constraints, the demands of the job and be able to say, Hey, come in, continue to stay in the industry, continue to talk to the people that you enjoy, that you like, continue to have an impact on the business instead of wrestling dogs and, you know, really being physical, you can work from home. You can, you know, do calls from your, wherever you are. You can, we had an office, so you still come into the office. You do like, and it was a cool way to transition people into additional opportunities, which you know, we're all about <laughs> a lot about. Yeah. And so I thought that was really fun and we got hippo to a, a, a great place and then found a, another sales director. Cause it was like, okay, like we've done it like mission accomplished. Let's get someone else in to run the, run the ship. And so we, we got that then the entire time and anyone in the vet space that's been around for a few years, probably knows smart flow whiteboard mm -hmm. technology. And at least once a day, a client would say, well, you have a smart flow, but man, have you ever seen what smart, you have a whiteboard. Have you ever seen smart flow though? Oh, it's the best. Oh, I wish it. And I was like, I gotta see this smart flow thing, this guy. And so I reached out to Dr. Ivan Zach, who is the founder and one of the creators of smart flow. And I was like, dude, what did you, what'd you make? I got to <laughs> see this thing. What's your brain doing? How do you work? What's going on with you? And about 15 minutes into our conversation, he was like, what are you doing? I was like, well, you know, doing my consulting. I you know, just finished up a, a big job. And he said, do you want to work together? I said, yeah, I like you. He's like, <laughs> I like you too. And we worked together for four years mm. straight from that phone call. Yeah. And so that was 
the way that I got into the into the industry and continued to learn in it. When you were working with Ivan Zach, and not only maybe that you worked with the smart flow aspect of things, but you also worked in the consolidation side of things. Yeah. Yeah. So I joined Ivan and a lot of the team after they had sold SmartFlow, some of the folks that had left IDEX. So I did, Ivan had left IDEX by that time. So no, no credit taken for the ability to, to talk about how great SmartFlow was more so just like, if I see someone that did something incredible, I'm like, yeah, let's learn, let's learn what that was. But yeah, so I, that was the, the aspect. So we, when we, when I joined Ivan and the team, it, they were working on veterinary integration solutions or VIS. And the thing that most people, especially on the corporate side of the business will probably recognize from this is if anyone has ever sent you a black and yellow PDF of all of the consolidators, where they are, what the price, you know, how many practices they own, who owns them, what the corporate structure is, all of that. That was our pinnacle project that we built within within VIS. That was the most client facing. And so what we were doing was consulting with consolidators. We saw that there was continuous burnout happening. And whenever we would sit down with large scale consolidators, we would look at their website and the website says every single website and even with our future group, you know, we had this right. We care about people or people first or our teams are our passion. Our heart, you know, is in the clinic or you go, okay, cool. That's awesome. How do you measure it? What are you doing? What's the key? And a lot of them say, well, we have a summer picnic every year where we invite them to the ballpark. You're like, okay, <laughs> what, what else? And you'd continue to find that it wasn't something that was truly measured or actioned upon. And, and then as we would dive deeper into the investment decks that the private equity groups were investing in, there was no component there that said, we're going to add 15 clinics utilizing your hundred million dollars. We're going to do this. But another key component for us is employee satisfaction, employee retention, uh, reduction to burnout, all of these things that that people put out there as being important. Mm. And if it, and our view was if it's not in the deck or the thesis that you're giving to the people that are giving you all the money, then it's not something you're really behind. Mm. And so the goal for VIS was to help work with those teams to be able to through either technology or coaching or mentorship or anything, be able to help guide them from a corporate level to understand the value of reduction. So one of the doctors that I knew well, they said doing well by doing good or, you know, and there was a, the other thing that we would say, there was an ROI on caring about people. And so it was a business case, right? Take care of your people. They'll stay, they'll be happy. The reduction burnout will be reduced. We like, and that's such a simplification, but right. There's a lot of things you can do to reduce this and you can make money from doing it. Mm. So you don't have to, it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a bleeding heart, you know, oh, you know, everyone will live in a shoebox as long as everyone's happy. <laughs> and you don't have to say, well, we're just going to make money no matter what happens. So that was the, the big piece there. We, we pushed on that for, for a while and eventually said, well, if we're going to keep preaching this, we might as well do it ourselves. And that was why we started Galaxy Nets. So we, a lot of the VIS team and some other wonderful people from within the industry got together and we started our own consolidation group, which is Galaxy Nets, which hopefully we'll have some cool new stuff to announce in the Uh coming, in the coming year. But we were at the tail end of the initial feeding frenzy for private equity. Um, And so we were reaching, you know, reaching to try and get additional capital and weren't able to be successful in that aspect of it and learned a lot, but pulled back, settled, held what we owned. Ivan's still working on the, on the galaxy vets team and, and pushing some really, really cool stuff has expanded to multiple locations in Canada mm. and more to come <laughs> from there. So, yeah. Yes. And, I, and Dr. Ivan Zach, who is a veterinarian has been on the podcast as well. So People can go back and listen to that episode to get ready for that very unique business model. And one thing that I think is so wonderful about you as an individual, but then what you're doing is that gap between a financial minded, 
you know, business and then the people in the clinic. Each one on each side doesn't always know how to translate mm-hmm. and come together and make it all this right. beautiful, you know, right. work. And so what have you seen in that perspective of trying to get kind of that both understanding of you have to have the complete picture to be successful, but also, you know, retain your talent, yeah. have a good culture, all of that. Yeah. It's, it's still super tough. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, right. We're here at, at VMX. And if you look at the, the course loads and the CE opportunities, there are more than I think there have been probably 10 years ago. I wasn't around <laughs> for it, but I, I would imagine if we look at the programming 10 years ago versus today, there's a lot more of, I was walking by uh, practice management and how to manage for a successful startup clinic. Mm, okay. And I think there's more of this conversation of the understanding of that. I think the continuous access to care that people are seeing as an issue are bringing to light some of the financial constraints that come into play and why we're seeing the increase in continuous consolidation of the industry for people to say like private equity doesn't flood into places where they don't know that they're going to make money. Right. That that's why they do so well. And that's why they went from dental to med spa to chiropractic to vet to eventually we will no longer be their sweetheart and they'll move to their next big thing. I hope that we can all be aligned to say cool. And that when we do bring in external capital like that, that, that we're understanding that, Hey, you're welcome to come to the party, but please leave the money behind. Right. And, and that's kind of the thing with galaxy vets. We we were looking at an, we had an ESOP, which is an employee share ownership plans. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's a lot of groups doing joint ventures and dividends and, and rev share. And, and that's kind of the thing to be able to, say, instead of saying, all right, you're going to buy this business for $10 million, you're going to grow it to a hundred. And then you're going to take that $90 million of extra capital and flood out with it. Yes. Yeah, so you take that 10 million, you'll, you'll make a hundred, you'll take that $90 million of capital and you'll leave. You'll take that 90 million, you'll go invest in another industry. I really think that we should think of how do we keep that $90 million within the space? How do we put that in the pockets of the people doing the work? How do we put it into entrepreneurs within the space? How do we do that sort of thing? So it is difficult, but it's one of the reasons kind of why I started my podcast. Mm. If we're going to do like the perfect transition. right? <laughs> and by how much I talk, you probably realize why I don't have guests on mine. I just go. But what I saw was you'll see it. I mean, you, you'll see it in the conferences that we're at. You'll see it at any event. There's kind of these places, the perfect example is there's the, anyone that's been to VMX has probably been to Rocks Bar Mm. in the Hyatt. If you haven't been, you should go. (laughs) You will see people that own your company there. Mm. You'll talk to the people that are deciding what the new drug is that Zoetis is going to bring to market. But what you might not see, and I think it would be cool to see more of, is a practice manager from a clinic in Tulsa who leads, you know, a practice that's part of a group and that they're there talking with a CFO of a large corporation, right? You don't see that. Right. And there's still these silos that, that exist and it's, you know, and I think the data probably will show, okay, well, you know, at the conference, some of these people never go in the expo hall. Some of these people never go to CE. Some of these people are never doing this. They're here and they have a suite in a room and they're just going up and down the elevator. Whereas a lot of other people are on the floor having communication. And so the reason I started my podcast was because I saw that gap for people. Mm. And I felt like my sister-in-law, who's a DVM, her friends, they were graduating from school. And I was asking them, oh, well, are you working in an independent practice? Are you working in a corporate-owned practice? And one of them was working at what they thought was an independent practice that I found out for them that was corporately owned. And I said, So they didn't know they were in a... They <laughs> thought it was more of a management agreement than an actual ownership because that's uh, how they represent it okay. in that situation. And it's nothing against her. It was, it's designed to be. Feel like a. Yeah. yeah. It still felt like the independent practice, which yeah. I think is great. But she was just like, yeah, I know my checks are kind of like come from this company, but they're just managing our books and our accounting and our marketing. And I was like, yeah, that's consolidation. That's what they do. Yeah. And, and then I was like, oh, well, so you understand that. 
their capital partner recently made this other acquisition in the space. So what you'll probably see in your clinic over the next few months is an introduction of this and this could, and she was like, no, like, why would I know any of that? And I was like, they're all talking about it. They all know these things and they're all watching for these moves. Mm -hmm. And I think if it would be, I think it's really interesting and a a unique opportunity through my podcast, through the birdbath is if technicians and practice owners and field reps and and people that are not able to sit down and listen to a four hour chewy investor day call can get 10 to 15 minutes and say, Oh my gosh. Okay. Zoetis made $350 million in Q3 on their top two selling drugs. When my Zoetis rep comes in with a dozen donuts for $12, I should like, I shouldn't be falling out for myself with gratitude. I should be thankful, right. And appreciative and, and just happy to have people looking out for the teams, but also be like, Hey, this is awesome. I heard that you guys came out with a new drug. I was listening to the podcast, to a podcast. They were talking about this. They were talking about the investor day. They're talking about Zoetis's intention, like where their goals are or where Covetris is trying to take their software strategy and, and be able to ask your reps or have them ask their teams, like, is there any way that maybe we could work on utilizing some of what you guys are doing at the corporate level to help upskill our technicians or, you know, Midmark, I think does an incredible job of a technician's dental training program. They will come in and train the technicians on the team to be able to do absolute highest, highest maximum level of the license. And it's been, it shows a massive rise in practice revenue, but also a huge employee satisfaction because you're giving people additional skills. They're learning new things. And that's what I like want people to challenge their reps and their field. Like, Mm. sure, I'll buy something from you. Oh, you brought me Chick-fil-A, right? Thanks for the nugget tray. But <laughs> like, hey, would you be willing to sponsor some of our, our techs going to a conference? Would you be willing to have a DVM that works for the corporate group do a Zoom call with us to talk about why they think this new drug is better and to dispel questions that the team might have? Like, if you know what's going on, then you can sh- ask for more or you can challenge it. And I think it's cool because I want it to be the day one kennel attendant. And I also would love for, you know, the CEO of MWI to learn something while listening to it, too. Yeah. So that is a, a great observation is the ability to keep the entire like everybody who this impacts in the know. Mm-hmm. But if we can also allow them to have a voice. Right. That is something I'm very passionate about, including veterinary technicians. Mm-hmm. They, they, a lot of these individuals don't have seats at these big tables, as no. you pointed out at the rock, which we just spoiled their hideout. We now know where you are. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we all knew. <laughs> we all, you can hear it like all the way down the hall. It gets rowdy. And, and going back to what you said, if when private equity is, you know, bored and they're ready Mm -hmm. to move on to the next Mm -hmm. thing. How can we learn from them the financial aspect of things to keep that learning within our industry to continue to grow in the direction we want to grow? Yeah. I think that first off, I recently wrote an article for today's veterinary business talking about what I see kind of the future for consolidation to be. And I think that the key and what we've seen is that there's a lot of people that grew their businesses on arbitrage, which is one plus one equals three, right? That's arbitrage. Okay. And that's why you saw practices getting gobbled up by large groups, because if they buy a hundred of them, they're worth more than a hundred individual practices. But when the interest rates rose, the capital markets dried up, people were more cautious with their investments. Those people were sitting there going, oh, I have to like actually run these businesses now. I don't want to do that. I just wanted to hold them for three years, not touch anything, not do anything, and then sell them to somebody else. Well, some of that's changed now. And what I think people should look at if they're looking at taking outside investment, whether it's for your own independent practice and you have, you go to a bank for a loan, or if you're taking $150 million from a private equity group, I think the key is that money should be an accelerant but not a lifeline. So if you're not putting yourself in a situation to be able to have 
self-sustaining business models that can continue so that when you reach out to say, you know, for an independent practice, if you're saying, Hey, we're doing well, we'd like to, you know, expand the practice. We want to add some more runs. We want to do these things. Let me get a loan. If the bank says, no, we won't give you a loan. It shouldn't be the nail in the coffin for you. You should have built this strong business that you're looking to expand and grow with. Mm -hmm. And I think it should be the same thing for a hundred million dollar investment, right? If you're not at a strong, solid foundation of your core practices, three practices, five, a hundred practices that are generating revenue, moving in a positive direction, that investment would allow you to do more of it faster. But if someone says no, it doesn't mean, oh my gosh, like we need to start laying people off. We need to close practice. So that's kind of what I, I think people should, should look at, like really understanding a strong core of the business. And that works for independent practices and that works for massive groups as well. What is the best way to start learning more of those things? Because if you think about a lot of these owners or veterinarians who didn't go to business school, right. how how do they learn some of those tips? So, uh, you know, to reference my, my father-in-law, he's a veterinarian. He owned s- several practices. He didn't go to business school. I have not been to business school. Uh, <laughs> I... I just like to read a lot. And I think the key thing is to ask questions. You know, there's, there's also some really cool business models that you can learn from. I think the franchise model is an interesting way Mm -hmm. for people to get into business ownership with guardrails. There's downsides to it, right? You have someone dictating some of the things that you can and can't do, but you also have someone that guides you to, you know, a successful business with marketing plans and those sort of things. I think that's a, a great way to look at it. I think, that one of the things that I love about the veterinary industry is that if you are genuinely caring about improving the industry, no one in this space is going to tell you that they won't sit down with you and talk. I think people can see through if you aren't genuine about that really quickly. And like the, the cool thing about the space is people will tell you usually it's a pretty <laughs> direct industry, but it, like if you're genuinely wanting to learn, if you're a, a technician in an independent practice, if you like genuinely want to learn how the business is run, I would be shocked if your practice owner, whether it's a corporate group, an independent, anybody, or somebody, you can reach out to me, like anybody in the industry, if you reach out and say, hey, I'm genuinely interested in, in understanding what the triggers are that drive the industry, I think you'd be wowed by the response that people would get. It's really like there's massive resources that are out there that people just need to grab at. Yeah. Well, speaking of what you were seeing in the consolidation space in the future, what other things are you seeing probably coming in the future for veterinary medicine? Yeah. So I always try to think of like what's going to be a hot thing for the year, right? Yeah. 2020, I thought it was going to be the cloud. Instead, it was a a pandemic. I did not see that. (laughs) That's okay. I had built like a whole (laughs) campaign in my mind around, okay, we are going to educate people on the importance of cloud technology and COVID changed that. But COVID also did teach a lot of people about the cloud. So maybe it, maybe it covered that for me. I think that we are, every single thing has the word or the letters AI in it. Mm. Right. Like, and I think that it's not going anywhere. I think it has a, a better staying power. I'd say two years ago, I think the buzzword was blockchain. A lot of people were using blockchain technology, which is, if you're not, you know, if people aren't familiar with it, it, it's the way that Bitcoin works. It's the way that it's the technology that allows you to have a digital encryption and be able to track a piece of information across the world anonymously forever. And I think a lot of people were excited about that. I don't think that it ever. I think the pandemic also kind of changed up the view on that. But I do think that a big thing that we're going to see this year is people taking real steps to adapt and increase access to care. Mm. That's what I think, like, if you try to piece all of the disparate puzzles together, I think they will all form an access to care picture. So we're going to see AI being utilized from 
you know, what vet power is doing with Ava, which is a, a phone answering, but it's an AI that answers the phone with a voice and answers questions and talks back to, and does the intake forms, you know, digital who I work with, you know, we've got the opportunity for intake forms. We have the opportunity for practices to be able to send emails and read directly from the PIMS and have chat and two way tech, like really integrated to be able to reduce the mundane tasks that are being done in the practice. And then you have signal pet that's using it or Radimal that's using it to look at the radiology and radiographs and be able to really read into those things. So I think all of that is decreasing workload on the practitioners, which increases the availability of appointments and, and scheduling. I think telemedicine, which is constant conversation. We're seeing the laws in California, Arizona, a lot of these places are coming into effect this year as well as last year. That's increasing the the slice of that pie to allow people to get appointments and available access to care. We have care credit and synchrony, which is divesting or moving their interest in Pets Best to uh, Independence Pet Holding, which is owned by JAB and, and sort of the largest fund in the world or one of the... But yeah, so we're seeing a lot of that. Everything, I think, though, piles on into the access to care mm. world. And so I think that's kind of the cool thing that that's surprising, that every time someone tells you something new, kick into your brain, how does this relate to access to care? And I think that's where we'll see that that continuous thread. So do you see a lot of things that are vet-centered or pet-centered or pet parent centered. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this last year I began my education in pet care. Okay. I have exclusively focused on vet care before. Yeah. It's an entirely different world. The food world, the treats, the add ons, the toys, those it's, it's an entirely different world. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) the, I would like it to stay vet centered. I I think that it would be important. Um, a lot of the things that I'm pushing on are with the hopes and the desire that we can find it to be continue to be vet centered and that the pet care companies continue to, or increase their importance on the veterinarians and the, and the, veterinary practitioners to actually listen to what they find is important. Financially, the pet care market is massive. Mm -hmm. It's got an unending amount of capital flowing into it. It's significantly easier for companies to enter. Um, It's, you know, a lot of the food suppliers in the space are marketing companies, right? Have you ever tried your dog's food? No. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they're not selling you on taste. No, they're not like it's a marketing. It's it, this is healthier or this is better. or This is more sustainable for the earth or this is better pack. Like they're marketing to us and that's how they get us to buy the right things. Cause none of us are going, Oh no, I like, you know, Coke versus Pepsi. Right. We're not sitting there tasting it unless mm-hmm. you're the CEO of you know, the Mars family. Cause they will. They will eat it. They will show you. So, and a lot of these groups, a lot of the big food people will eat their food yes. on stage for you. So yes, they will. I have not done that. I don't know if I'll be able to be in the, in the pet care world if I have to do that. But <laughs> I think ultimately though, the, every dollar that people are looking to get, and if you just slice it out, right, that businesses, there's an amount of dollars that exist in the world. And people are trying to get them from someone else's pocket into theirs. Mm -hmm. The pocket that they're all trying to get from is the pet parent's pocket into the business's pocket. So ultimately, a lot of this is driven around the pet parent. I think a lot of the technology companies, no matter the slice that they're taking, and maybe not all, but the ones with high amounts of data, Mm. which is becoming more and more valuable with AI, The higher amounts of data that a company is focused on, the more that we will expect it to be looking to find direct access to the pet parent, because that's where you monetize that data. 
whether it's choosing pharmaceuticals, whether it's breed specific answers, whether it's where they live and how to build practices or how to get into their digital wallet, like any of those sort of things, that's ultimately what's driving it. But I think that if we as a veterinary component of the industry can continue to keep the care for the animals as a shining light, I think that will be really important. Mm. Well, when you think about the care of the animals, both the vet and the pet parent side of things, they very much value that. So yeah. Yeah. it's a it's a good starting point for sure. It's, a, it's, <laughs> it's definitely a better starting point than like, do we want to sell them a 45 pound or a 60 pound bag? Yeah. Right. It, it's a good starting point, but it, I mean, this is why I like people to, to stay abreast of what's going on. It, a, an independent practice is fighting against a massive machine of money that's pushing, you know, Dr. Jones independent practice isn't running Super Bowl ads. No. Right. You're needing to work harder, I think, to have the veterinary voice heard in some of these situations. But all of the data shows that veterinarian opinions are the gold standard. Mm -hmm. So don't get discouraged by a really cute ad and someone coming in and asking you about, well, I saw the ad for a farmer's dog. Like I want to switch to doing this. And if you are as a veterinarian, first off, don't just say no, because it's not your answer or your idea. But if you've researched and looked at it, you can say, hey, these are what I find is valuable about it. You know, I would recommend a kibble with a topper if you're looking for something. Like, find those kind of things and participate in that. And look at having a digital storefront or, you know, your own access to be able to carry that inventory, do drop shipping on that inventory to be able to get some of that. It's There's plenty of opportunities for them. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of it is listening to who your audience really is. So if you are a single veterinary clinic, listen to the pet parents. What are they asking about? What uh, do surveys ask what they value the most? Because even though you're not doing a Super Bowl commercial, you have other values that, and yeah. you know things that you can offer that for the right audience, they're going to want that more than the company who has Super Bowl ads and oh, yeah. they don't feel appreciated or you know what not, what not. Absolutely. I think there's still opportunity for whatever style of practice that you want to do, mm-hmm. whatever career you want, it will even make it broader than that. So, I mean, I, I think this industry is extremely exciting. We yeah. seem to have kept you for a little while. Maybe we'll continue to I, intrigue you. Yes. I <laughs> absolutely love the veterinary industry. I have no, like it sometimes this will be the corniest thing I probably have ever said. Not all who wander are lost. Right. (laughs) But I think like I've, I've looked around for a place where I could feel really at home and embraced and my oddities maybe are, are appreciated. I'm kind of a, maybe I don't come off as a goofball, but I like being a little goofy. And I think the vet space is really fun. Um, and I think like it's, it's a really, really special industry that, it's not the same as private jets. I'll tell you that it's a very different industry. There's people that are passion driven. It's really cool to be able to be around people that, you know, wake up every day wanting to improve the industry that they're in, not because it's going to make them billionaires, but it might. (laughs) And, but like, it's really cool to, to see, especially at a conference, like all the people that are, you know, have a tattoo of dogs, on their face. Cause they're like, I love them so much that every second I need people to know that <laughs> it's, it's really cool. I'm yeah. I love the space. I'm could not, I very much expect to retire from the veterinary community and that be my home. And then probably be one of the old guys that keeps coming to the conferences and people are like, why is Ryan still here? You can't you know, get like, enough. <laughs> just love it. Yeah. So it's been, it's awesome. 
Thank you for being part of Vet Life Reimagined. Please make sure you check out Ryan's podcast, The Bird Bath, that releases every Tuesday morning and is within 10 to 15 minutes of the most relevant industry news. I love it and listen myself. Ryan reads all the news so you don't have to and wants you to stay informed. If you aren't, please subscribe to Vet Life Reimagined and send me an email at hello at vetlifereimagined.com on what you thought about this episode. As always, we have a lot more coming for you, so take care.